This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 10, Hacking Las Vegas. My class? How are we doing with this one? Can you hear? There's no event staff at all, so I have no idea whether this works or not. No speaker. This guy? that one. Okay, that's working a little better. Um, well, since there's no event staff, I guess, to introduce me, uh, I'll introduce myself, and then uh, I'm going to ask for a request. All right, my name is James Chorash. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is Las Vegas, gambling, cheating, how the casinos defend themselves, all kinds of stuff that you never thought you'd know. Um, some of you might have seen the speech that I did uh, a couple years ago here at DEF CON. Um, what I've done is update this speech with a lot of new stuff. So um, some interesting and exciting cheats that have happened in the last couple of years that I'll update you on. Um, where do we start? I have a lot of slides. I want to get through a lot of material. We'll go pretty fast. Um, if there's someone in the audience who wanted to do slides for me, it would be a big help. If someone could flip these slides, I can get through a lot more than get through the material. I'd be willing to provide lots of great gambling information, how to beat the casinos and black check card counting. We have a winner. Uh, this one? I mean, this, this mic is on. I tried this one earlier. It doesn't seem to... Uh, I'll try it. Is this any better? Yeah. Better, okay. I just don't get much range with this. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll start. As I say, we'll have to kind of rip through this. What I want to talk to you initially about is kind of basically how the casinos defend themselves. And then we'll take a look at, and we'll spend much more time, I think, on the attacking techniques. The attacking techniques basically in two groups. One is the outright cheats, the illegal maneuvers. Um, the second part is really ways you can legitimately beat the casinos. So just an idea of how much money we're talking about, how much money these guys make, billions and billions of dollars. Um, I believe in Las Vegas itself. Just the city itself won five billion dollars just in slot machine revenue in the last year. Um, we're talking about some monster dollars here. This is certainly something the casinos really want to protect. They're not willing to let you know a billion dollars here or there slip by. Lots of money to take. Lots of people have targeted Las Vegas because of all this money. Uh, next slide, please. We'll quickly talk about the regulatory agencies. This is just the way that Las Vegas defends itself, or partly defends itself. Um, the difficulty, I think, is that lots of these jobs are, well, they are government jobs, don't pay that well, don't exactly attract the best and the brightest. But this is sort of the, the regulatory structure for Las Vegas, the various commissions and control boards. It's the same in Atlantic City. It's the same in various gaming jurisdictions throughout the United States. Very similar situation. Uh, the casino hierarchy. Basically, the question is, who is out there defending against cheats. Who's watching out for cheats? Um, this particular slide talks about the rankings and the VP of Casino Operations is where it all starts. He's the, the head cheese. And it goes downhill from there to a shift supervisor, pit bosses, floor persons, and dealers. Um, you've seen all these people in the casinos. Um, we'll move on. Um, surveillance. Uh, the people who, on the previous slide were the people who were there in the casinos that were actually watching you and looking in real time to see whether or not you're cheating. This is the electronic surveillance surveillance system, which is the surveillance the people that you don't see that are hanging out upstairs in surveillance. Now, surveillance works in conjunction with the Black Book and Griffin. Uh, the Black Book is basically a list of the undesirables, the people in, in uh, Nevada who can't even step into a casino without being thrown out. There are 26 people there. Uh, they reserve this for people such as mobsters, uh, people who have been convicted of various criminal felonies. Um, 
Um, I believe anyone convicted of cheating the casino automatically goes in. Uh, anyone, let's see, the other category I think was script kitties go in? No, I'm sorry. That's, they're not really in the book. Uh, 26 people in the Nevada Black Book. And Atlantic City has a, a similar book as well. The other thing that I have is what's called a Griffin book. It's a uh, four-volume series, and it is just chock-filled with pictures of various undesirables. Um, I don't want to say some of you are in there, but it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, throwing flares into elevators might get you in. I don't know. It's mainly for people who are cheating at blackjack and people who are cheating slot machines. They also throw in, for good measure, people like card counters, who, according to the Griffin folks, are cheaters. Uh, God knows why using their brain would be considered cheating, but they do it, and they throw these people into the book. There are no laws or anything about who can go into the book. So if you happen to be standing next to a cheater, and the folks at the Griffin Agency think that since you're standing next to a cheater, you must be a cheater yourself, and you go into the book. Uh, it's about 2,000 names. It's updated monthly, uh, used in a couple hundred casinos all over the world. One thing to note at the end here, five players were added to this book a while ago just because they posted some things onto the internet, perhaps about uh, card counting. Um, just be careful out there. Uh, I don't know. I don't think that I am. Um, I'm more of a blackjack theoretician. Uh, the Griffin 2000 system, they actually are trying to up upgrade their systems and make it a little more electronic. I mean, believe it or not, they have heard of like databases of photographs and face recognition and stuff like that. And they're starting to develop systems now where they can take an image from a casino. They'll take a surveillance camera image. They'll send it to a central uh, center control or central repository. They'll compare it with images in a book or images in a database, make the connection, send the picture back to the casino. So they are just now, in 1999, beginning to get into the, uh, the electronic age. Uh, the manpower and the budget of the casinos, kind of, this is a, a question of how much surveillance is there out there? The average casino is about, has about 250 cameras, but this is changing pretty rapidly. As casinos are being built on the strip, you'll notice these monster casinos, 3,000 rooms, those have a lot more cameras now, and there's definitely a move towards bigger and bigger cameras. Uh, Taj Mahal claims to spend $20 million per year to combat cheating. I think that's just Donald Trump being a little uh, overzealous. Uh, he also claimed 1,200 cameras, which was more than any building except the Pentagon. Uh, I believe that has been eclipsed recently by Foxwoods casinos, if any of you live in East Coast, uh, they claim to have 3,000 cameras now at that casino. And one thing to note, these cameras are not just about catching cheaters, it's actually catching things like slip and fall cases. And you'd think that casinos would worry more about losing the cheating than someone falling down and then suing them for $10,000, but it turns out those lawsuits are pretty common, and some of those can be for very large amounts of money, so those cameras are actually there in many cases to stop a fake slip and fall suit. They're still all in the bathrooms. The, the equipment, uh, cameras were added in the 1980s. Um, casinos are tending to go towards a single camera on every single game. So if you think that you're going to walk into a casino and pull off some cheating move on one particular blackjack table, hoping you haven't got a camera on it, well, good luck. In the, in the modern casinos and the larger casinos, they're going to have a, a camera on every single game. And in many cases, they're going to be videotaping every single game, every, every single hour of the day. They're going to keep those tapes for a couple of days. Um, as I said, the larger properties, many larger properties now have almost a thousand cameras. The technology I won't get into um, into details, but as you can imagine, um, they're using surveillance cameras from the retail industry, for example, and they're using them in the casino business. Um, they're GUI driven. They think that's pretty cool. I think you know it took them a decade to get there, but they've got a map of the casino, and they can basically look at look at the map and touch this area on the map, and several several cameras will automatically swivel and turn to that particular area. Uh, a cash, re cash register tie, and I thought was kind of neat. They've got some cameras that are set up in cash registers because, of course. They They've got bartenders that are taking, you know, 50 bucks a day out of the register or ringing up drinks. What they do is they have a camera on the register, and at the same time, all the data from the cash register is being sent to the surveillance system. So they've got a, a split screen set up where they have all the uh, um, all the point of sale data showing up. At the same time, they also have a picture of the guy and what he's doing. Cage and credit. Uh, this is kind of interesting. A lot of people cheat the casinos in blackjack by getting credit and then stiffing the casinos, of course. So cage and credit is a hot topic for, uh, for slot cheats. Um, one interesting thing to know about credit is the fact that 
the only two things they look at when deciding whether or not to give you credit, other than whether you're a hacker or not, would be how much money do you have in your checking account and have you ever stepped a casino? That's all they look at. That's all they care about. They don't care about savings account. They don't care if you've got $6 million in Yahoo options. Makes no difference. Um, things like income, debt, previous credit history, totally irrelevant. Uh, typical credit fraud. This is how lots of people like to sting the casinos. Um, it's easier said than done, but here's basically how it works. You go into New York, for example, and you get $100,000 in cash, and you set up your bank account. You go to the casinos, and you establish a line of credit. Now, they lick their lips thinking, geez, here's a guy who's got $100,000 in cash in the bank. He wants to set up a line of credit. We're going to take this guy for take the guy to the cleaners. Well, you establish the, the line of credit. You arrive in Vegas on Friday night, and you start taking out markers, and which is basically taking out a loan from the casino. They don't care because you've got a $60,000 line of credit. So you check markers up to $55,000. You start gambling and you start palming some of the chips, throwing the chips into a purse or throwing the chips into your pocket and pretending you're losing lots of money. You give those chips to your confederates. They cash the chips in. And at the end of the whole deal, you leave the casino owing them perhaps $50,000. They deposit those markers, assuming they're going to go to your bank and they're going to clear against your $100,000 on a credit. But of course, on Friday afternoon or uh, perhaps Monday morning, 8 o'clock, you have closed the account down, withdrawn all the money, and you have gone scot-free. Uh, general, general cheating concepts. Um, I worked for one of the largest strip casinos for about five years um, before I got smart and got into internet startups. Um, cheating actually is fairly successful. Casinos would like you to believe that no cheaters get away with it. And they love to do things like uh, throw, they like to talk about the surveillance systems and things on television shows. You'll see Dateline ABC, I think, had a recent thing about casino cheating. And they love to make it sound like there's 600 people watching you and that there's no way you could get away with even winning 50 cents off the casino. But the truth is, and what the cheaters will tell you, is that the professionals are often very successful. Um, what trips them up, generally they'll do things like, one, they'll be a little bit too greedy, and they'll take a lot of money and decide they can take any, you know, an awful lot more money. And they get greedy and they end up getting caught. Uh, alternatively, they have cheating scams that involve a team of people. And guess what? You've got four people on your team, and one guy gets disgruntled, his girlfriend goes to somebody else, he gets mad, he tips off the feds, and the next thing you know, you guys are all in prison. Uh, as far as cheating goes, the casinos are definitely worried about somebody coming in from the outside and cheating them, but what they really dread is somebody on the inside cheating. Because if you've got, for example, in blackjack, a dealer colluding with a player, uh, capturing that and, and capturing the players and figuring out that it's happening is really, really difficult. Uh, some of the typical player cheating methods that you'd see uh, on the casino floor, marking cards, bending cards, uh, bending the tens and aces, pass posting where you are playing a roulette wheel, for example, and you're actually making the bet after the ball has stopped bouncing. Um, collusion with dealers is fairly common, and the cheaters typically will go after a dealer that they think owes money to someone, or in some way, you know, for whatever reason, they have a, a drug habit or something like that. They need the cash, and someone will go to that dealer and say, look, I can solve all of your debt problems. Just collude with this player for a while, and we'll take the casinos for some money. Uh, counterfeiting is a very popular form of uh, very popular form of cheating. The disadvantage, of course, is that it would be a federal crime, and you tend to end up in federal prison for many, many years. But uh, the lure of being able to print your own money is just a bit too strong. And there are some people who've decided to go after casinos in these counterfeiting cases. Atlantic City seems to have been attracting the most attention in that there are three casinos that have lost more than $100,000 in counterfeiting. Uh, it's not just bills that people are going after; it's also the casino, um, the casino tokens, like slot machines for example. Um, if, if you've seen the high-end slot machines, they'll have $5 tokens, $25 tokens, or even $100 tokens. So counterfeiters have decided to counterfeit those instead of counterfeiting real bills. And an example was uh, Caesars got stuck with $10,000 in uh, $100 chips that were that looked very real, but you could only tell the difference by like dropping them under a hard surface. Um, Russian mobster was involved in counterfeiting uh, slot machine tokens. It's, it's a big business. It's a lot of money. Luis Covalecchio uh, was one of the bigger counterfeiters on the, uh, on the East Coast. His counterfeit tokens were so good that they actually needed microscopes to tell the difference between his tokens and the real tokens. 
uh, the way that they actually found out that this guy was passing bogus $5 tokens was that the inventories in some of the um, Atlantic City casinos started increasing dramatically. They just didn't know why. And uh, ultimately, they, they found out um, Secret Service agent Fran Brennan, probably not here today, was the one who uh, cracked the case open. Uh, this was actually a violation of the, uh, a trademark violation for a counterfeit. Uh, don't mess with the Patent and Trademark Office. They're, they're tough guys. Uh, bad checks, uh, always popular. Uh, it's getting more popular in Vegas, I guess. Chinese organized crime, they, they claim, have been passing as much as 500,000 a month in bad checks in Las Vegas. Uh, it's very difficult to stop these crimes, but um, I know that quite a few Las Vegas police are involved. One thing to note here, the fact that it's not just counterfeit checks, they're doing more identity takeovers, which is kind of interesting. It's not really a counterfeit check. They're getting the, I the IDs of gamblers, for example, and getting checks, getting legitimate checks printed up and using them. My guess is that the identity takeovers is going to become a big and bigger slice of this market. Uh, bill validators, this is definitely one of, the, one of the more popular targets for cheats, and it's a very popular target for counterfeiters. Like if, if you want to counterfeit a $100 bill and you hand it over to a grocery store clerk, for example, they're actually going to handle the bill, they're going to look at it, and if your bill is not really good, they're going to catch you right there. But a bill validator, if you walk up to a, a, a video poker machine and it takes $100 bills, you know, there's no one watching you. It, it's a very tempting target in that if you try to put a bill in that's not accepted, it just kicks the bill out. It doesn't call the feds automatically. Although that would be kind of interesting, interesting uh, addition to the machine. Um, the, the technology has been improving over time. Um, originally, at least, they were a magnetic head which read the uh, um, read iron levels in ink because um, dollar bills and, and uh, currency had high, le high iron levels. Unfortunately, there are a number of copiers that also had um, the same high levels of iron in their ink. And so the second generation machines that are now coming out that are kind of looking at the iron content within the ink itself and looking at very much finer particles, and this, is being, this has actually been very successful. Um, Cash Code is a company that's been talking about how they've had some, um, some very high technology and higher technology practices. They talk about how secret their technology is. Um, you can generally be, you can get some of these secrets if you want by taking a look at the patent databases. Um, they've issued a couple of patents uh, in this area. You can also take a look at foreign patents, which published 18 months after their pri priority date in the U.S. Um, generally, patents are a good source for getting information about bill validators. Uh, coin statistics, just some kind of odd numbers to throw at you to get a sense for the scale of the casinos and how many coins we're talking about. Um, opening up casinos takes millions of dollars in coins. Um, I've got some stats here about some various casinos that opened up recently, huge casinos, and how many tons of coins it takes to open up. Uh, I think one thing to note, if you look at the statistics, statistics carefully, something jumps out clearly, uh, and that is that the Mandalay Bay got some really badass armored trucks, I think, because they, it only took them 15 armored trucks. It took Bellagio 56 armored trucks, so clearly they got some really big armored trucks. And interestingly, um, Bank of America has what they call coin vaults. You know, most people think of a bank, they think, yeah, there's, there's branches everywhere, there's Federal Reserve branches. There's now these, these vaults that are just for coin transactions, and they've got one in Las Vegas that actually has the Bank of America vault, has like four bays, four separate bays for, uh, um, for armored trucks to pull up. Uh, we'll take a look at some quick notes on some of the cheating, some of the spectacular cheats that have happened. Um, I think Gareth Thackeray mentioned uh, Ron Harris earlier today. This is one of my favorite examples. Ron Harris worked for, um, worked for the Nevada government and worked for the Nevada Game and Control Board. And basically his job was to check the chips that are put into slot machines. And so the agents would go into the field and they'd open up a slot machine, and they'd, like a video poker machine, they'd pull out the chip and they'd take it back to their offices to check to see whether or not the chip had been cheated. Well, Ron Harris, as he's doing this job, decided he would introduce some of his own software into the chips and then go back out into the field. So guess what? After hours, after he'd finished working, he'd go back to the same machine that had this chip. He would have this, his own code implanted, in it, implanted into it. And what the code did was, it looked for certain patterns of coins. So if you entered like four coins and then three coins and then three coins and then five coins and then one coin and then two coin, it would trigger a jackpot. And so he did this and was very successful for a while, but ultimately was convicted 
uh, and I believe is now in prison. He was caught in this hotel room with a laptop, computer, police scanner, and cell phones. That sounded very familiar, I think, to me. But. <laughs> Uh, Dennis Nikrash, I don't know how to pronounce his name, was a very recent sheet. I think Wired Magazine actually had something about Dennis. Uh, he won six million dollars, so his team allegedly won six million dollars from cheating slot machines. He initially said he was going to tell the feds exactly how he did it, and he backed off of that. And I haven't seen any information yet about exactly how he did this, but the rumor is that he was taking chips, taking a chip, he would, well, he would get to the slot machine, he would get a key to open up the slot machine, he would take out the old chip, put in his gaffed chip, and then replace the chips again, close the machine up, and someone would come by, one of his accomplices, accomplices would come by to, uh, to get the win, to pull the win off the machine. It was cracked by an FBI source, oddly enough, who happened to just overhear a conversation between a couple of people, and uh, the FBI source told the FBI, blew the case wide open. One of the guys on the team, uh, another very nice guy, apparently, uh, Richard Charlesworth, convicted of a slot cheating scam, $10 million in 1984, so he's been around the block, he's done a few things, but I mean, that's bad, but you know what's really bad? He was arrested with me crash for burglarizing pay telephones. Now that, that's really, that's too much. You know, I can see a $10 million slot cheat, but pay funds, you can't do that. <laughs> Uh, Anti-counterfeiting. Anti I talked about counterfeit tokens that are being used in casinos. They're now starting to defend, or they're trying to defend because it's been a fairly, um, a fairly common crime. They're defending by putting more intricate bevels and edges, and they're also starting to get into computer chips built into the, uh, the tokens themselves. Um, Osborne Coinage has some out now. Um, they say they last three to six years. The problem is that these coins in, in a casino, you can get, you know, as I said, you know, as you saw on a previous slide, tons and tons of coins, and they're pouring out of buckets, and they're pouring into counting machines, and there are tremendous forces on these tokens. And so computer chips, you know, fairly fragile, tend to get too beat up. But they are working with this, and apparently, I don't know of any casinos in Las Vegas or Atlantic City that are testing this yet. I believe it's more being tested internationally right now, but expect to see this soon. And I also expect there's going to be some case of some guy who hacks the chip, and it's got to happen one of these days. Um, the Canadian chemo fiasco is one, one of my absolute favorite uh, casino disasters. This was not a case of casino cheating. This was a case of a casino mistake. It was wonderful. Um, what the casino was doing was they bought a new, casino, uh, new chemo machine, and if you've seen chemo being played, they had this blower device, and the balls blow around, and they get, and the person reads the balls, kind of like bingo. Well, they decided to buy one of these devices that was a new device that didn't have any of these blowing balls. It was a random number generator. You know, it saves some time. But I think this was a, well, it was a Canadian operation. They weren't too swift, and they installed the machine, and at, and at the end of every day, they would just turn the machine off, and the next morning, they'd turn it back on again. Well, they didn't, didn't read the manual, which said basically keep the machine on at all times. And what happened was, some guy was watching Kino, you know, lucky day for him, and he said, gee, this is kind of interesting. The numbers are like coming up the same every day. Well, rather than telling the casino this, of course, <laughs> He, of course, decided that, well, if I know what the numbers are, I may as well bet a few, you know, eight spot tickets or ten spot tickets, which pay off like $50,000. And he managed to collect about uh, several hundred thousand dollars before the casinos figured out what was going on. But, of course, you know, what can the casinos say? Uh, gee, you know, we were stupid. <laughs> The cheating devices, I talked about Ron Harris, and I talked about opening up a machine and replacing chips, for example, putting them back in. You might think, it's ridiculous. If you go out onto the casino floor, how can you like open up a machine and put a chip in and not have someone notice you? You know, there's cameras there. Well, what the, what the cheaters are doing are using blockers, boomers, lookouts, and collectors. Blockers are guys that are typically, you know, six foot five, and they're 300 pounds, just enormous people. They're there, and they know exactly where the cameras are, and they're standing in a strategic location to make sure they block the camera view. Uh, often they're going to pick a slot machine in a certain area of the casino that has less coverage than other areas of the casino. Uh, boomers are typically, typically scantily clad women who will stand somewhat away from the area of action and just create some big ruckus. They'll get into a fight with their boyfriend. It just creates some kind of disturbance to distract attention. Uh, the lookout is obviously look at it, just someone there who makes sure that none of the um, casino personnel happen to be walking by at the same time. The collector is someone who's going to step in, someone who's on the team who's going to step in to collect the jackpot. Because if you've got a cheating team and you've got one guy opening and closing the, uh, the slot machine, you don't want him actually collecting the jackpot. So you get some guy who looks like he just came from, you know, somewhere in from Ohio or something, and gee, he just happened to win this jackpot.
Uh, the monkey paw is a, a legendary cheating device, which I think was used uh, more in the past. Slot machine companies have done a lot to defend against this device. But in the past, at least, what people did was, it's, it's kind of like a little, simplistically, a flash, uh, flashlight bulb on the end of like an 8-inch wire. And what you do is you put that into the area of the slot machine where the coins fall out. And where the coins fall out, you've got various sensors that check that count the number of coins that are falling through. So if you disable that sensor and you hit a jackpot, Instead of winning, instead of 20, 10 coins falling through, the coins just keep falling through because the sensor can't tell the coins are falling through, so it just keeps saying, send more coins. So you can actually get all of the money in the slot machine to go pouring out. But these are very difficult to use, and uh, as the last note mentions, it requires a kind of strange body posture that's kind of a dead giveaway. And it's also hardware. You know, when they catch you with these, one of these devices, you're hanging under this thing that's definitely a cheating device. Um, lots of states out there that have mandatory prison sentences for using these things. Uh, slot machine keys, you might also wonder, exactly, exactly how is it that someone would just open up a slot machine on the floor? Well, um, there are one or more keys for each slot machine that the casinos have, but it's very difficult to maintain control over these keys. Um, you often have, you know, you have slot machine mechanics that just aren't paid that much money. Maybe they owe, someone's, they owe someone money for gambling losses or whatever. Someone approaches them and says, look, for $3,000, if you give me one of the keys, you know, we'll give you, we'll give you the money. Sometimes they say yes. Um, and that gives you access to the machines. You can actually open up a slot machine and turn the reels and set a jackpot. You turn it to bar, 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 and then close the machine up again and win the jackpot that way. Um, next slide. Uh, miscellaneous slot machine cheating methods. Uh, just about every method has been used in the past. Um, one of them is drilling, where people will drill a very small hole into the machine, and they'll insert a wire into it, and use that wire to set the reels on the machine. Uh, sometimes they'll hide the drill bit. They'll put the drill into a cigarette pack, pack, or into a purse, or something like that, and just hold it against the machine. Uh, electrostatic discharge is one of my absolute favorite cheating methods. There were machines, I believe they were called P&M poker machines, that you won't find on the floor today, but you could actually walk around the casino and generate and, and, and pick up a certain amount of static electricity, touch the machine, and the static discharge would actually cause the machine to pour all the coins into the tray. <laughs> I understand there's, there's some really wonderful footage of a guy playing the machine and he's standing and his leg is like kind of cocked out to the side. He's like rubbing furiously on the floor I and mean, then very surreptitiously kind of touching the machine and collecting the money. But like I said, those, those machines are gone. Uh, hand manipulation, you wouldn't think that you could actually cheat a slot machine with no tools at all, but there were some bar top video poker machines manufactured by IGT where you could in some way get your hand into the machine and cause it to pay out, I think. Um, certainly IGT was very quiet about exactly how that happened, and they have since instituted various measures to prevent that, but it did happen and it cost them a lot of money. Um, some of the really simple stuff, toe tappers and slot fleas, toe tappers are just people who are stealing money out of people's purses, they're dragging a purse close to them, slot fleas, people who are stealing money out of the person's bucket next to them, so cheating is not, not always a very high-tech affair. Uh, it's not just the players that are cheating, there are manufacturers who cheat as well. Sort of an equal opportunity cheating. Uh, 1989 American Coin actually manufactured video poker machines that did not pay, that did not come up with royal flushes. Like it, it just couldn't happen on the machine. They changed the software on the machines. Uh, it's pretty ballsy to do that. They got caught. I don't know. I think um, they lost their license. They lost a couple of a couple of senior um, senior employees. I don't know if it was in prison time, but it was a pretty bad scene. Uh, internationally, although in, although in the U.S. I would, I would wager that you know 99.9999% or 100% of the machines right now are fair. Internationally, if you're going to go to Moscow, for example, or go to Rio and play machines, you know, some of the machines are rumored to be gaffed and cheated and will cheat the players. So I would be careful internationally. Um, silicon gaming is an inter interesting story. I don't know if you've seen the machines on the floor, but it's an entirely computer-driven slot machine. There are no spinning wheels. It's basically just a PC with a big screen on it. Um, obviously, this is kind of interesting to the hackers out there because you know hacking this would be kind of an interesting, uh, interesting win. The problem with silicon gaming now is that the company is not doing well. Um, to put it in IPO terms, their IPO, I believe, went up to about 20 like a year ago. They're now trading at 50 cents a share. I, I 
Yes, the company is still holding, still holding on, but I think they might fade away from existence, in which case you might not see these machines anymore. But they certainly have started kind of a trend in the industry, and a lot more machines are going towards completely electronic devices. Uh, blackjack cheating, of course, is very popular and has been for many, many years. Uh, there are some fairly sophisticated me methods. I mentioned that you could just mark cards, for example, but there are also some sophisticated methods like cameras, where you've got cameras hidden inside a guy's sleeve, and that guy's arm is on the table, and he's trying to actually capture on video the dealer's whole card in blackjack, for example, transmitting it out to a van. Um, the van relays that signal back to a guy's earpiece, for example, and he makes bets. Uh, it's very high tech. I don't think it's you know, it's, it's certainly very uncommon when you get caught. Again, you've got an awful lot of hardware on you. It's certainly going to be substantial prison time. Uh, slug scams are uh, slug scams. Slug scams are performed by the dealer who is not shuffling correctly, and they're going to find a clump of tens, for example, or a clump of aces, and try to shuffle them such that they stay in one clump, um, and then players will exploit those. Cooler is a really a pretty spectacular move. Cooler is actually introducing an entire set of cards into play that you have pre-arranged. And what people do is, uh, you might see a game like a six-deck shoe in blackjack. Well, people will go home and they'll arrange a six-deck, six decks of cards in a certain order, and they'll go into a casino, and they'll collude with a dealer, of course. They'll get seven players to sit at every single spot. And when the dealer puts the cards out for the player to cut, someone will actually take the cards, drop them into a purse, and pull out the pre-arranged six decks of cards. They'll put that into the shoe. They'll start dealing, the players know exactly what card is coming, they increase their bets dramatically and win a lot of money. It's one of those cheats where there's, there's no hardware left over, but it is a pretty gutsy move because hiding the fact that you're pulling six decks off the table and replacing them is not easy to do, of course. But it does happen, and then casinos can lose upwards of you know, fifty to $100,000 in one shoe to this method. Oh, and, and uh, inside jobs, sorry, uh, do happen as well. The a former VP of the Sands actually was colluding, colluding with the dealer one day. Um, oddly enough, when he was arrested, he got no prison time whatsoever and got probation. You know, that's 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 life when you're a VP, I guess. Uh, marked cards. A lot of different ways that you can mark cards. One shooter claimed to have used cobalt paste in a Geiger counter strapped to his leg. This may be more apocryphal than real. I certainly haven't seen one of these devices. Um, lots of people have lost lots of money worldwide. Uh, gamblers at Sikwan, Sikwan in California lost 100,000. Uh, recently, I think Caesars in South Africa, or, or a casino owned by Caesars in South Africa, lost about a third of a million dollars to cards that were marked at the factory itself, which was kind of interesting. Um, lastly, one player was suspected of marking cards on a riverboat casino. I say he suspected someone from the casino sort of walked towards him. He got spooked, uh, left the table, and actually jumped off the riverboat and ended up dying, which is not a really good outcome, I guess. But I guess the lesson would be learn to swim before you learn to cheat. I think. Concealed computers were more popular in Las Vegas many years ago when they were legal. Uh, now there's like a, I believe there's a, there's a one year minimum sentence if you're caught using uh, concealed computers to cheat in blackjack. But you know, it gives a person a 2% edge to play perfect basic strategy with a computer. And what people do is you've got a computer and as the cards are coming out, you're entering data into the computer by actually pressing, uh, pressing small switches in your foot. Occasionally, early on at least, people got caught because they had very primitive of computer equipment, and it would short out, smoke would come out of the back of their shirt, you know. so it was, it was difficult. Roulette, you still get some cheating, it's not a big game in the US, it's much larger in, uh, in Europe. There was, you know, magnetized balls have been used, putting lead into the ferrets inside a roulette wheel. If you put lead into the spot where the ball can land, uh, it's not going to bounce out as often, so it tends to land more in that spot. Uh, but, you know, roulette is not a big game in, in Las Vegas, and I think, I'm sure there's almost no cheating roulette in Las Vegas. Craps uh, is another game that attracts cheaters. Generally speaking, cheating is harder in craps than in blackjack. It requires much more deft moves and much more training. You have 
dice sliders who actually have, will throw the dice across the felt. One die bounces, the other die sort of slides along the bottom of the felt. And if you can, contr if you can control one die, control it to be a six, for example, there are certain bets that you can make in craps that will, that will pay off. Uh, but that kind of move, you know, people will typically spend, uh, you know, six months, a year, or even more just perfecting that one move. Uh, you also have the various rail birds and rail thieves, the common kind of stuff that you see all the time in Las Vegas where someone just leans over and grabs your chips when you're not looking. Bakura. Baccarat attracts a lot of attention just because of the size of the bets that are allowed. Uh, these numbers are a little bit dated. The Mirage, I think, used to, used to take bets of up to 750000 a hand. I would believe now, I can't imagine the Mirage would take, I, I'm sure they would take a million dollar bet. Bellagio would, would definitely take a million dollar bet. So with that kind of money in action, it certainly attracts cheaters, but the casino surveillance is going to be much stronger in the Baccarat pit. And anyone who's betting that much money, you can be guaranteed there are multiple cameras taping this thing, and you can be guaranteed that the casino surveillance guys are watching this one very, very closely. But there are occasional cheats that happen. There was a false shuffle that took about 700000 from the casino. So it happens. Uh, Caribbean stud poker was uh, it, it's a relatively minor game in the scheme of things. People can pass cards back and forth. There was a, a fairly sophisticated scheme, at least the way the newspapers reported it was a fairly sophisticated scheme involving this computer hard miniature camera and a van outside. Uh, New Jersey State Police were baffled. They really didn't know what, um, exactly how the cheat worked. Uh, I suspect that they were just checking to see what the dealer's card was or other player, player cards were being sent back to the van. Even the lowly pull tab, this is strictly speaking not really a casino cheating thing, but if any of you have been in the Midwest, for example, and you've seen those little pieces of paper where you, you pry open various little bits of paper and you can see if you line up three, three you know, matching bell symbols, you can win you know, a certain amount of money. Well, counterfeiters stepped in and created counterfeit pull tabs and cashed as much as 40000 per day for a while until someone was caught. I'm not sure about how that person was caught, but again, when you've got six people working on this, someone's going to be upset, disgruntled. You know, that's how these things happen. Um, mistakes, are, mistakes are some of my favorite things to talk about for casinos. Uh, the two-for-one blackjack promotion happens all the time. When you pay, pay two-for-one in blackjacks, they ha the player edge is like 2.31%, but a lot of casinos just aren't that sophisticated. They don't read the blackjack books. They don't like math at all. And they think, gee, it'll be fun. We'll have a promotion. We'll pay, play blackjacks two-for-one. Well, some casinos have done that. And the minute that you do that, uh, if they will take large enough bets, the information ends up getting onto the net within a matter of hours, for example. And the very best blackjack players who play for very high stakes will swoop in from all over the country, descend on the game, and take it for hundreds of thousands of dollars. There was a riverboat casino that I believe lost several hundred thousand dollars, maybe more like a half a million dollars, to a promotion like this. And it was just kind of stupidity. The casino really should have known that they were going to lose a lot of money like that. Texas Station had a similar kind of situation where they decided to offer double payouts on uh, for a kind. They just didn't think it through. They didn't think about the math involved. And once again, the sharp people descended on the casino. There are various internet news groups and there's various, um, various electronic mail newsletters. The information spreads very rapidly these days. Everyone shows up to beat the games and they lost an awful lot of money before they finally closed the promotion down. I'll kind of, I'm going to skip through some of the next, some of the next slides um, we'll go through briefly, but this is just, just some numbers that can give you an idea of how much the casino edge is and how much of an edge the player can have with legitimate ways to win. Um, I think the interesting thing to note here that in blackjack, if you're a card counter, you're thinking you're going to win every time? No, not at all. A, a professional card counter, and these guys are very, very rare, are getting like a 1% or 1.5% edge over the casino. It's certainly not something that's going to, that's going to make you rich unless you're betting an awful lot of money on every single hand. Uh, craps is kind of game where it's a very small house edge as long as you're playing pass and don't pass. If you're betting any of the field bets and stuff like that, you can easily get crushed. Craps, of course, is a game you cannot beat. Lots of people will tell you, oh, find a hot table, various insurance methods, um, various double up betting schemes and things like that. No, the fact is the math of the game says you cannot beat the game. So unless you're going to cheat or unless you're playing some mistaken promotion or something, you're not going to beat craps. Uh, other games, various house edges ranging from as much as you know 30% down to very tiny, tiny edges like in Baccarat. 
slot machines is where all the money comes from in, in a casino. You know, when, when most people think about a casino, they think of the table games. They think craps and blackjack and kind of the, the exciting games. They don't think about slot machines. Well, all of the money is in slot machines these days. Uh, I believe that in Las Vegas, on the strip now, something like 70% of the revenues are coming from slot machines now. And slot machines, you know, you buy one for $6,000 and you plug it in and you gotta pay electricity on it and you earn, on the strip at least, about $100 a day from these machines. So if you do the math, if you're paying like 5,000 bucks for the machine, after 50 days you've paid it off and every day from there is gravy of 100 bucks. And paying electricity is really not that, uh, not that expensive. So it's certainly a lot cheaper than paying black check uh, floor people and dealers and pit bosses and all that kind of stuff. So all the profits are in slot machines. Everything the casino does these days is to get you to playing the slot machines. The table games are there almost just to keep you into the casino to make sure you don't walk across the street. They just want you playing the slot machines. Um, I've, I've talked a lot about beating casinos by cheating them. Um, certainly those are... Ill Certainly those are Ill illegal methods. There are plenty of legitimate methods and a lot of what I did at, at uh, the casino that I worked with years ago was taking a look at legitimate ways to beat the casino and how to defend the house. And some of those ways are simply infre infrequent gambling and, and low house edge games, video poker, blackjack card counting, and poker. These are all ways to get a very small house edge over the house. Thing, man. Just, you know. How do I compete? I could give away hundred dollar bills or something. Yeah. Root access. access, right here. It's all free. Um, infrequent gambling is one of my favorite ways to, to beat the casinos. They're counting on you to gamble. They're, they're going to set the room rates. They're going to set food and beverage at very low prices in the hopes that you're going to gamble. We just disappoint them and don't gamble. Um, play things like you know sports bets, for example. You know, make twenty dollars sports bets where the casino is going to make very little money on you. Uh, video poker, a lot of people don't realize how beatable this is. There's certainly a lot of people in this room that have the brains, the discipline to beat video poker. It's not very complicated. You know, get a good video poker book, get the software and learn how to play. Um, there are machines that will pay back approximately 100% of what you put in. You play those machines and you can get a lot, of, a lot of money back in the form of free rooms and free food and beverage. It doesn't take that much discipline to do it. You can even play video poker with a card. You know, I've played video poker with a sheet of paper that described exactly what I should do every step of the way. I mean, every single decision is laid out. Um, you, can be, you could always be, you know, you don't have to be that smart to beat video poker. Uh, blackjack, obviously you can do card counting, but this is very difficult to do. Of, for every hundred card counters you talk to, maybe one can actually make money at the game. You know, when you ask people about card counting, I, I come across this all the time. People will tell me, oh yeah, I know how to card count. And you say, oh well, you know, what system do you use? You know, high low, high opt, red seven, you know, what, what system do you use? Oh, uh, gee, uh, I, kind of, I, I, I count tens, kind of. It's a dead giveaway, they have no idea how to beat the game. You know, if you're a good, if you're a good card counter, you play precisely, there are no hunches, you know exactly what to do. If a person is a good card counter, they can rip through all the basic strategy, strategy decisions, they can rip through the value of the cards, it becomes almost automatic. The problem with, with card counting, I think most of you could actually could count cards successfully, it's really boring. Uh, exploring the comp system is one, of my, is one of my favorites. Every casino has a formula basically that tells them how, many comp, how much to give you in front of comps. And they look at your average bet times the hands played, times the house edge, times the comp rate. And for example, if you're a $100 better in blackjack, they're going to expect to play 60 hands per hour, a 2% edge, and they're going to comp back 40% of your money, so they're willing to give you $48. And so if you played 100 bucks a hand, they'll give you, you know, buffet comps or, or, uh, um, or room discounts and stuff like that. Well, if you're a comp expert, you can actually go after each and every one of these numbers. You can go with a starting bet of $100, for example, and then when you're not looking, you scale back to 50 or scale back, scale back to 25. The hands played, you're going to play very slowly. You're going to find, find a table that can't do 60 hands per hour. You're going to find a, a table that's doing 20 hands per hour. Be better yelling, talking, ordering drinks, stuff like that. You can also um, beat them up on the house edge. They're going to assume that you have 
that you are a tourist and that you're playing at like a 2% disadvantage. Well, if you're playing basic, basic strategy in blackjack, it's like a half a percent edge. So if you multiply all that out, they really should only give you like $4 an hour at the most. So if you're exploiting and you're asking for comps, this is a way to actually, this is a way to get a lot of value out of the casinos um, related in card counting. Uh, just an idea of what it takes to get comps. If you're looking to get something, um, you know, how much money it takes. This is going to vary, of course, casino by, by casino. Card counting, I, I won't go through this. It's just a, a rough indication of how the game works. It's, it's less of a science than you think. People see the movie Rain Man, for example, and they think that card counting is all about memorizing cards. It has nothing to do with memorizing cards. It's only memorizing point values. Like an ace is plus one, uh, as I eat, well, ace would be minus one, a 10 value would minus one, a seven plus one, a two plus one. Um, you're just netting numbers out. So what you're keeping in your head is just a, a cumulative number. It's like plus three, plus four, plus five, plus four, plus three. You're not actually memorizing cards, so it doesn't take a photographic memory. There, are, there is some software now to track blackjack card counters. The casinos were, were very unsuccessful at stopping card counters, partly because they just weren't sophisticated enough to understand. I mean, believe it or not, there are lots of casinos that would employ a blackjack expert to, cap, to capture the, uh, or to capture the uh, blackjack card counters and stop them from playing. Well, some of those guys didn't even know how to count cards. They didn't want to read the books. They didn't want to get into the technical details. Um, they were very unsophisticated. So what they're trying to, starting to do right now is to use software to actually watch people play, entering all their playing decisions, and let the software tell them whether or not they're a card counter. Poker is my favorite game, of course. Uh, it's probably the toughest casino game to beat legitimately. It takes years and years of dedication, discipline, um, a fair amount of intelligence. Top players can make like $100,000 per year, but it's a tough living. There's no 401k, there are no health benefits. And I think if you're good enough to win $100,000 a year in poker, if you're smart enough and you're disciplined enough, you really should get into Java programming or start up your own internet startup company or something. It's much more lucrative. Uh, and that's the end. I left a few minutes if people have questions. Uh, also, I have a printout of some more detailed notes from the, uh, the presentation. So at the end, if people want to take a look at the more detailed notes, I can give those out. But take a few minutes of questions. Yeah, the question is, do, do casinos shift the payout rates on slot machines? It's a, it's a common misconception, sort of a... Um, a lot of people think that they do, they really don't. The, the chips decide what, it, what is the house edge for a casino, and once they plug that chip in, it stays pretty much. If anyone, if anyone has follow-up questions, um, I will try to show up tomorrow sometime and maybe schedule one of the, uh, the smaller rooms just to take questions, or I can hang out in the main, main hall, or just stop me and ask me. I'd be happy to talk about uh, all your insane blackjack questions or casino questions. Thank you. Thank you.